Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our KDGO webinar series on IGA nephropathy and FSGS. This is our fourth episode of the series with focus on management, treatment, and recommendations for future research in focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. My name is Laudan Zand. I'm a general nephrologist from Mayo Clinic Rochester with interest in glomerular diseases. I will be your moderator. I'm joined here by our discussant, Dr. J. Radhakrishnan. He's professor of medicine from Columbia University, New York. He's the clinical director of nephrology division and his clinical and research interests are in glomerular diseases. He's an associate editor of Kidney International and founding editor, editor-in-chief of Kidney International Reports. He has lectured extensively nationally and internationally and has received numerous awards for his educational and patient care related um, contributions. He'll be talking to us about management and treatment recommendation in FSGS and future research in this area. First, we'll listen to the recording of the talk by Dr. Radha Krishnan. You can enter your question through the chat function during the talk. After the presentation, we should have about 15 to 20 minutes of time to review these questions and have them answered for you. We will now listen to the talk. Thank you, Dr. Land, and a warm welcome to our attendees once again. My job today is to talk about the management, the treatment, and research recommendations for focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. These are my disclosures. So I will use two cases which will springboard this discussion. The first patient is a Caucasian woman in her 30s, and she developed the, an abrupt onset of full nephrotic syndrome. Her proteinuria was 13 grams per day, and her initial biopsy showed minimal change disease, for which she was given oral prednisone. And as you can see, she did not tolerate it very well with uh, oral candidiasis, a lot of skin breakdown, cellulitis, and despite two months of therapy, remained heavily nephrotic and was then referred to our center. We did a repeat biopsy, which showed uh, as you can see on the right, classic lesion of FSGS. And importantly, there were severe and diffuse changes in the tubules suggestive of ATN. And even in a short time as two months, she had developed mild to moderate tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis. So the question is, what is the basis of her FSGS and how would you manage her? The second patient is quite different. Um, She's also in her 30s. Uh, back in 2008, she was known to have proteinuria and microhematuria during a routine exam. At that time, she was normotensive. Uh, there was no family history of kidney disease. And her kidney function was normal. Her serum albumin 2 was normal. And at that time, she had only 351 milligrams of protein with some red cells in her urine. Then she came to a nephrology clinic five years later, and you can see that at this time she had delivered a child and her kidney function was worse with the creatinine 1.41. Her serum albumin had dropped a little bit to 3.1, and now she had nephrotic range proteinuria, at which time she was started on an ACE inhibitor and a kidney biopsy was performed. And in this case, she had a focal global sclerosis, Two glomerular short focal segmental sclerosis, you can see here. And she had non specific immunofluorescent changes. And importantly, she had 40% foot process effacement. As compared to the previous uh, patient who had 100% foot process effacement on the kidney biopsy. So, what is the reason for her FSGS and how would you manage her? These two cases will be will form the objectives of this talk, which is to review the initial treatment of primary FSGS and how do we manage steroid resistant primary FSGS, approaching the relapse and what's ahead in FSGS treatment. And the essential point to note is that we need to understand fully as best as possible what's behind FSGS. So this is the KDGO classification. You can see on one end we have primary FSGS. For patients present with the full nephrotic syndrome with low abdomen, the onset is quite sudden and there is diffuse foot process effacement, typically on the kidney biopsy. 
And these patients would be amenable to therapy as opposed to the most common form, which we call secondary FSGS. And unfortunately, there are three completely distinct etiologies hidden in this category. So viral FSGS as typified by HIV or even COVID-19 associated uh, nephropathy is one example. And that's quite different from, say, the adaptive FSGS, where because of a mismatch between size of the glomeruli and a number of glomeruli and the requirements of uh, what the glomeruli need, we have hyperfiltration. And there is typically segmental food process effacement, and you may have proteinuria without the full nephrotic syndrome. And then in the middle here is genetic FSGS, and this could be familial, syndromic or sporadic. And we have lumped one group where we are not clear of what the underlying cause is. And we call this undetermined cause, where these patients may have segmental food process effacement. They may have proteinuria without the nephrotic syndrome, and there's no evidence of a secondary cause. So why is this important? So this is an approach that the KDGO uh, formulated. So if you have the full nephrotic syndrome and it's defined by a low serum albumin below 30 in the presence of nephrotic range proteinuria. So both of these entities need to be present. Edema is not that important. And if you have electron microscopy, diffuse food process effacement is helpful in categorizing these patients. So these patients should be considered for treatment with immunosuppression. And if there's no response, then one could consider genetic testing before escalating therapy in the form of additional immunosuppressive agents. If the patient does not have the full nephrotic syndrome, so you can have one of two situations. They're either nephrotic range proteinuria, but do not have low serum albumin, or they could have subnephrotic proteinuria, then these patients should be carefully evaluated for secondary causes. And at least in our center, we uh, do genetic screening in such patients. And these are not candidates for immunosuppression, but just supportive therapy. And on monitoring if patients develop a typical phenotype of primary FSGS, one could consider immunosuppressive therapy in such a situation. So the cornerstone of conservative therapy, as we all know, is RAS blockade, salt restriction, and optimizing blood pressure control. The key aspect of management is that the lower the proteinuria, the better the prognosis. And of course, we strive for complete remission where the levels of urine protein drop to below 0 0.3. But that's not sometimes possible. And quite frequently, in fact, especially with primary FSGS, it may not be possible. So one is equally happy if they go into what we call partial remission. And there's a definition that's been used um, until recently of conventional partial remission. And we'll talk about the modified uh, uh, definition uh, further down. And these are patients who drop down to levels between 0 0.3 to 3.5 grams of proteinuria. And they need to document a greater than 50% decline from baseline. And if patients do respond either completely or partially, a relapse is defined as proteinuria going above a nephrotic range, 3.5. After complete remission or an increase by 50% if you have achieved partial remission. So, in when we come to the categories of FSGS and how do we manage them, uh, for secondary, the underlying process should be managed as far as possible. And these patients are typically not candidates for immunosuppression. And the same goes for. FSGS of undetermined cause. Once again, conservative therapy and a very careful look for secondary causes and treatment of these causes if uh, found subsequently. The treatment for primary FSGS is still high dose corticosteroids, and these are considered first line unless there's a contraindication. So the dose is given, a high dose is given for up to 16 weeks or until a remission is achieved, whichever is earlier. We call patients as being steroid resistant when they're persistent proteinuria above nephrotic range, or um, there's less than 50% reduction 
despite high doses of prednisone, defined as one to two, one milligram per kilo per day, or two milligram per kilo every other day for at least 16 weeks. At month six, if you have not had a response, we call these patients as having uh, corticosteroid resistance. If you do respond and you relapse within two weeks, we essentially call them as being corticosteroid dependent. So how do we treat such patients? Uh, calcium inhibitors are now considered as initial, can be done in patients who are uh, have contraindications. For example, diabetes, uh, poorly controlled, or obesity, or psychiatric problems. So we may avoid glucocorticoids altogether. And then for patients who are steroid resistant, uh, either cyclosporin or tacrolimus should be considered for at least six months um, over further treatment with glucocorticoids. In patients who do not respond to CNIs, and we have suggested levels of cyclosporin between 100 to 175 nanograms per mil. And if you're using tacrolimus, it's between five to 10 nanograms per mil for at least four to six months. So if, if you've not achieved a response by this time, we call patients having CNI resistance. So if you do respond to a CNI, what is the minimum time period? It's about 12 months. And after 12 months, you can try to slowly taper these patients off of a CNI. If you relapse within two weeks of stopping CNIs, we call these patients as being CNI dependent. So what if you fail both steroids and CNI? Uh, at this point in time, we don't have a recommendation from the point of view of KDGO, but such patients should be referred to a specialized center for a biopsy, perhaps for alternative therapies or enrollment in a clinical trial, and certainly for genetic uh, evaluation. So what, what happened with patient one? Patient one fits criteria for primary FSGS. She had full-blown nephrotic syndrome, 100% um, foot process effacement, a very low serum albumin, and did not respond to corticosteroids. In fact, she had, um, she had major side effects from corticosteroids. So this is what happened. We tried to give her uh, cyclosporin, with which she went immediately into AKI. It had to be stopped within two weeks. Uh, rituximab was tried next. She failed again. And un unfortunately, within two years of onset, she uh, went on to need dialysis, after which a living donor transplant was uh, was uh, was was done. Uh, she had immediate recurrence, as you can expect, uh, of FSGS in the transplant, and she actually did okay with plasmapheresis, but has remained plasmapheresis dependent for over 10 years now. So between one treatment every two weeks to two or three treatments a week, depending on the degree of proteinuria and nephrotic syndrome. She is being managed and she has slow progressive CKD. We'll talk about patient two um, subsequently, but let's talk about research recommendations that the KDGO made. Uh, there's a clear need for uh, predictive biomarkers in primary FSGS since none of the biomarkers have really um, been uh, completely reliable as being associated with primary FSGS. We do need uh, several RCTs, not other than novel therapies that we'll discuss, but uh, how long should we use glucocorticoids? There's been no real RCT in that area. Should uh, steroids be used in combination with CNIs or can they be used um, as monotherapy? Uh, what is the optimal duration of CNIs? And then what's the role of plasmapheresis or LDL apheresis in the setting of native uh, FSGS? So all these are questions that could be answered in, in clinical trials. But what I'd like to talk about is precision medicine and how can we help patients with FSGS using this novel uh, methods of detection and subsequently therapy in terms of what is the etiology of FSGS? How can we predict responses to a certain form of therapy? And what is the prognosis in a given patient? So let's talk about genetics first. And you know, clearly there are over 60 monogenic disorders 
associated with FSGS and uh, it's growing. The question is how and when should we detect uh, or look for genetic disorders? And it's really a function of age, the younger you are. The chance of getting a genetic diagnosis is much higher, but even at the age of 17, and this is a very early study, uh, we're using just a 27 gene panel. We're now using a three, almost a 400 gene panel to look for most of the uh, uh, monogenic disorders. And it's likely that it's gonna be increasing in number, the number of people of genetic causes of FSGS. But uh, this, this should be considered in patients, especially if you're steroid refractory. So the KDGO said genetic testing may be beneficial for selected patients, and these patients should be referred for centers that have the capacity to not only test, but also provide genetic counseling. And who are these patients? Clearly, if, you're, if you have a very strong family history and features of a syndromic uh, disease, or uh, there's something about this patient that doesn't fit a particular uh, a phenotype, uh, clearly, if you're considering escalating immunosuppression, uh, genetic testing should be considered. And we are also very particular that patients who do have a genetic positive test, their donors should be evaluated before being considered as, uh, as clear for donation. Um, there's a controversy about APOL1 in the setting of donor testing, and that study is ongoing right now. And of course, uh, prenatal diagnosis, this is very important, and now we have the capacity to do pre-implantation genetic testing to select embryos that do not carry the uh, pathogenic variant. So patient two was interesting. Remember she had a very mild disease uh, which progressed over five years to uh, an arthritic range proteinuria and progressive CKD. So in her case, we instead of immunosuppression, we actually proceeded to do genetic testing. and. Not unsurprisingly, and this is in the absence of family history, is that she had a collagen 4 uh, pathogenic variant. Okay, so this completely changes the uh, way we would treat her because it, there's clearly no role for immunosuppression. And uh, she could be enrolled in a clinical trial that does not use immunosuppression. So a few words on, on genetic testing and FSGS. So this is our study that we published in the New England Journal several years ago in a large group of patients with both CKD and ESRD. Some, they, these are basically unselected and the hit rate is about 10%. And you can see the single most important genetic diagnosis was a collagenopathy, especially when you look at patients who had a phenotype of any glomerular disease. So, um, and this is uh, not children, but in adults and children. So it's very important to consider genetic testing when you have CKD of unknown etiology, or especially FSGS that is steroid refractory. So this is also validated in a study by the uh, Toronto GN registry. They looked at patients with FSGS and biopsy, or a patient with proteinuria and a family history of, uh, of FSGS. And you can see once again, the collagenopathies were the single most prevalent uh, diagnosis, even above the porocyte genes, which are the second obviously common uh, diagnosis. And also the uh, K-cut genes were represented in this group, which represents the hyperfiltration form of FSGS. So what is important is if you do make a genetic diagnosis of FSGS, uh, the response to cyclosporin after failing steroids um, is not very high. As you can see right here, if you are, if you do not carry a genetic diagnosis, your response rate is about 80% to cyclosporin in a pediatric population. And if you do carry a genetic diagnosis, as it's as low as 17%, even lower with the congenital nephrotic syndrome uh, patients. So what we are doing at Columbia, and we have uh, we have a pilot study that we are actually preparing the manuscript is we. Uh, look at the kidney biopsy once the diagnosis is made. Uh, the patients refer to the study team to assess eligibility. We do a genetic counseling, draw a sample, and the hope is to achieve a genetic result in two weeks. So this is the uh, uh, first set of patients. You can see there are 10 patients. It took us an, on an average to complete genetic sequencing of about two weeks, and results were delivered between, within three weeks. And you can see that the diagnosis 
uh, was changed when we had a positive genetic uh, um, variant associated with FSGS. And it did lead to uh, a management change in that immunosuppression was stopped. And in fact, one in one patient was referred for a clinical trial uh, with sparsentan. So early diagnosis is crucial in such patients because you can avoid immunosuppression and then uh, target them to appropriate therapies in terms of clinical trials if they're eligible. The, there's a growing evidence of the mitochondrial genes uh, associated with FSGS. So genes with, which are CoQ10, CoQ6, and CoQ8B are associated with FSGS. And interestingly, they do respond to uh, supplementation with CoQ10. You can see that if you look at treated versus untreated, there's a big difference. So once again, this may be a treatable cause of genetic FSGS. So going one step further, the Neptune network is looking at uh, multiple omics uh, as a method of uh, classifying patients with FSGS and other uh, porocytopathies. And the idea is to use multiple methods of analyzing such patients, not only the biopsy, but uh, genotyping them, looking at serum and urine proteomics and metab metabolomics. You want to see if patients can be separated based on these um, markers into perhaps those who would respond and not respond to therapy, those who would progress and so on. So um, the second uh, cohort that is being studied is called CureGN. And here we're looking at primary FSGS and Dr. Gravi at our center is, is one of the uh, PIs for this study. And there are some early data in this area. So the Neptune trial looked at uh, uh, kidney biopsies, and then they looked at which genes uh, were expressed or not expressed. And they can they could define two clusters, so cluster X versus Y and Z. So X was associated with lower chance of getting proteinuric remission and a much higher rate of disease progression. And then you look at the genes that separated these two clusters. You can see that the immune response and uh, inflammatory pathway genes were affected selectively in cluster one versus uh, cluster X versus the others. So this is another way to sort of separate patients and uh, prognosticate perhaps uh, how they would do uh, in the future, looking at this uh, omics uh, uh, approach. So another example of how this approach works is uh, using what we call single cell transcriptomics. And if you look at um, this approach is uh, we can separate the patients into two groups. Uh, you can see that there um, one special molecule of interest is this endothelial alpha-2 macroglobulin, which is an inhibitor of protein C. In the group that had higher levels of this protein, you can see that they tended to have a much lower chance of progression. So another way to predict uh, remission and progression using uh, biomarkers. And the third question is, can we predict resistance to therapy? And here we're looking at, again, the similar approach. And se several proteins are associated with uh, steroid resistance in patients who have pediatric nephrotic syndrome. And then another. Uh, the same Neptune group, they looked at urine EGF, and you can see very clearly in, in the levels of uh, urine EGF, the lower the EGF, which is a uh, protective factor, was associated with more rapid loss of kidney function. And then TNF, tumor necrosis factor, is a pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine. And again, there are a whole bunch of genes that get, that get turned on and off with expression of TNF. And you can see three distinct clusters. The cluster in red, as you can see, had the highest rate of GFR decline. And this also correlated with the degree of interstitial fibrosis. So a lot of uh, new developments on the horizon. And the important thing is how can we uh, target therapy so that a specific patient with a certain pathway can be helped with a certain drug. And you can see our current therapy is that the entire uh, group of patients are lumped into one basket. And as a result, it might be effective in 20%. And in 80% of times, it might be wasted. But if you separate patients into different 
uh, who have associated signatures that are different from each other, and you choose a therapy that's going to affect one group of patients, it might be much more efficient to use this uh, approach. So the most clear example of a gene which is a risk factor for uh, kidney disease is APOL1. And this is a, a current um, association chart. So interferon associated FSGS is the highest um, as called the closest association with the high risk APOL1 genes. HIVAN in both Africa and US, FSGS of all uh, types, and of course ESRT. And finally, lupus with collapsing features. So all these are associated with APOL1 high risk genotype. And the way the these high risk genotypes cause disease is not fully understood, but there's a whole bunch of possible mechanisms that have been elucidated in scientific experiments. So there could be insertion of a channel uh, which leads to lysosomal um, uh, dysfunction and causing cell damage. Uh, it can also cause mitochondrial dysfunction. There is uh, changes in ubiquitin, which uh, can lead to decreased degradation of APOL1. There can be a global suppression of protein synthesis. Uh, and very importantly, inflammatory uh, mechanisms are upregulated. And of course, endoplasmic reticulum mm -hmm. stress is also part and parcel of the high-risk APOL1 genotype when it's upregulated. So the question is, can we suppress APOL1 directly? So one drug is called VX147. It's currently in clinical trials. And in fact, um, when they looked at an interim analysis, you can see that there was a reduction in proteinuria in patients uh, who were given the drug. You can see this uh, based on this uh, analysis. And now this drug has been, uh, uh, is being tested in a phase three study in proteinuric patients who have the APOL1 uh, high-risk genotype. And uh, other drugs are also being tested in this pathway, either directly or indirectly. So we do use rituximab, uh, sometimes indiscriminately in FSGS when nothing else works. And we know that the response rate is very low, perhaps 10%, 20% if you're lucky. So the question is, can you predict which patient might respond to rituximab? And here in this study, they found that those who responded had lower baseline levels of t-cell activation and you can see right here there's clearly a difference in in the t-cell activation markers so some are normals and some are low and if you combine three markers you can get a area under the curve of 0.9 insofar as who would respond to rituximab versus who would not so that is a, a promising method of predicting rituximab responsiveness and then there's endothelin endothelin is a multifunctional uh, cytokine that does a lot of uh, negative effects on the glomerulus and the tubular interstitial compartment. Uh, affects the blood vessels. It can cause porocyte dysfunction, leads to interstitial fibrosis, mesangial uh, dysfunction, as well as inflammatory uh, cell uh, upregulation. So if you were to block endothelin, uh, this might help patients with FSGS in a, through a variety of mechanisms. And it turns out that endothelin is quite close to angiotensin II in its mechanism of action. Every single aspect of what endothelin does is also uh, replicated by angiotensin II, for which there are blockers. So there's a blocker, sparsin 10, which actually has both angiotensin I receptor affinity as well as endothelin I receptor affinity. So two mechanisms of action in one molecule. So this was tested in in a phase two trial called DUET. Um, so over eight weeks, there was a reduction in the sparsentan group compared to the Erbersartan group, 45% versus 19%. And this is the new uh, FSGS endpoint. It's 40% reduction and one less than 1 1.5 uh, grams per gram of uh, uh, protein, proteinuria. So if you combine these two, uh, we call this the FPRE or uh, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis partial remission endpoint. And this is now what's being used in clinical trials. And that was done, that was seen at 28% versus 9%. And the adverse events were similar. Sparse and then had a greater effect on lowering blood pressure, but the EGFR remained stable in both groups. 
And what is interesting is at the end of this uh, uh, randomized period, all patients are given the drug. So those on the sparsentin and IRB and, and the uh, herbicide and gray, they both achieved similar levels of protein reduction at the toward end of towards the end of the study, which is of the 50 to 60 percent range. So a promising drug. Uh, the results will hopefully be out uh, end of this year, early next year, and which might lead to another drug being available for our patients with FSGS. So this is a phase three study, and you can see that an interim analysis showed a similar reduction of proteinuria above erbisartan in the um, uh, sparse intent group. And the, the focal, uh, the FPRE, which is the interim analysis, was again uh, sustained at high level in the patients receiving sparse intent. Another pathway is the slit robo pathway. Once this pathway gets activated, there are a whole bunch of downstream events leading to porocyte dysfunction, and blocking this pathway experimentally has been shown to improve all the events that are associated with porocyte dysfunction, many of the events. So the drug that's being used right now is being tested in, in the PORO trial. It's called PF0673512. And again, there are two doses being tested in a phase 2A open-label trial to see uh, which dose is appropriate. Another pathway is the TRIP-C5 pathway. So when you have porocyte injury from any cause, uh, this RAC1 uh, essentially is an activator of uh, a channel called TRIP-C5. It's a calcium channel which releases calcium into the uh, cytoplasm and it basically positively upregulates this pathway. And when RAC, a lot of RAC1 is uh, floating around, it actually causes directly uh, cytoskeletal changes that promotes porocyte injury. And it leads to disruption of the, uh, to loss of porocytes and the barrier basically gets disrupted. So GFP887 is a blocker of this TRIP-C5 channel and it's been currently investigated uh, in patients with FSGS uh, to see if it reduces proteinuria and uh, uh, affects this FPRE uh, endpoint. There are some pre preliminary results. Again, there's a 30% reduction in the protein excretion rates. Um, so you can see that 90% uh, of patients who are treated with the drug versus 57% of placebo uh, reduced proteinuria, and in fact, patients who are treated with placebo increased proteinuria. And more interestingly, if you look at urine levels of this uh, biomarker, so in people who had a reduction of the biomarker below a certain threshold, they had a 48% improvement in proteinuria over placebo. So interesting uh, interim results, and uh, we shall see how it works at the end of the trial. And then finally, there's always a question of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. So you look at the DAPA CKD trial, there were about 100 patients with biopsy proven FSGS. And looking at the primary composite endpoint, which is GFR decline of more than 50% ESKD or death from any cause, there was no difference in the two groups in, with respect to this primary endpoint. But um, despite an acute reduction of GFR as expected in the DAPA group, the decline of GFR over the study period was much less in the patients who were treated with uh, DAPA compared to placebo with the difference of about two, uh, which was um, close to statistical significance, did not quite reach there, but uh, there was a signal. And what is important is that if you look at reduction of proteinuria, um, you can see that patients in DAPA on blue seem to have a much more reduction in proteinuria. And this reduction in proteinuria was uh, actually correlated with a less uh, steeper slope of decline in EGFR. So there may be a role for DAPA or other SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with FSGS if you can document a lowering of proteinuria in these patients. But at least in the uh, analysis, the a prior analysis, there was uh, technically no difference in the level of EGFR decline. So the last question is the role of apheresis in native kidney FSGS. And this was a uh, collection of patients that were gathered between 1997 and 2020. 
with refractory idiopathic or primary FSGS. And they received apheresis treatments. There were only 21 patients in this group, both with FSGS and minimal change disease, you can see. But they were steroid refractory, so they fit the criteria for uh, what we call FSGS clinically. So in this group, there was a 33% uh, uh, complete or partial remission. So again, this could be considered not only in transplant patients, but in some patients with uh, refractory FSGS. And the factors that were associated with remission were if patients were on dialysis, surprisingly, before phrases, mm -hmm. and older patients, and patients who were early diagnosed very early. And this is very critical in uh, not only in transplant patients, but in native, patient, uh, native kidney biopsy, uh, native kidney FSGS patients, because you wait too long and there's photocyte loss, there is not unlikely going to be an effect with any therapy. And again, if you see a decrease in proteinuria between the diagnosis and aphrases with whatever treatments you can offer, uh, this also may be associated with the response to aphrases. So to cut a long story short, we are in a pretty exciting phase of FSGS clinical trials. Lots of uh, novel therapies are being considered and many are reaching uh, the end of their um, clinical trial data should be available in the next one to three years. So to end, I should say that uh, we are all very familiar with FSGS. What is very important is that um, FSGS has a lot of underlying patho mechanisms, and one should spend a lot of time and effort in trying to elucidate what's behind this, including genetic testing. And uh, uh, please try to enroll these patients in cohort studies that are looking at uh, this multi-omics approach as well as uh, novel therapies for clinical trials. And clearly there's no one size fits all therapy. And this uh, matching the uh, underlying characteristics of patients with a particular form of therapy is what's going to be the future as we get more and more informed about the underlying molecular biology and genetics of this very vexing condition called FSGS. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we're open for questions. Thank you very much, Jay, for that wonderful presentation, reviewing in great detail the potential therapies available for this patient population and some of the challenges in treating these patients. You know, one of my favorite slides was the one that you showed us how we need to select the right patient for the right therapy. So treatment A for patient A, treatment B for patient B. And if you don't um, do this, we may miss effectiveness of a given therapy and think that it's ineffective, whereas it could be for the right patient. And it also just highlights how this disease can sometimes be heterogeneous, even as it pertains to patients with primary FSGS. What I've been struck by in clinical trials of FSGS is that we are not even really able to recruit patients who truly have primary FSGS for the trial of FSGS. There is always lack of data on degree of food process effacement. The average protein urea in most studies is less than three and a half, just as an example. You show the data on the duet studies and the entry criteria for UPCR was more than a gram. And it's hard to you know, really think that a patient with two grams of protein really has primary FSGS. So can you speak more about how we should go about designing trials of primary FSGS when we are selecting patients? There was also a comment from one of our attendees about if you can also comment about the duration of therapy uh, to show a difference in the GFR slope when we are comparing an effectiveness of a tr uh, drug to a placebo. Right, so all very good questions, and I'm not sure I can answer these questions with any precision because, uh, you know, the big, the big problem with FSGS is even if we put the experts together in a room, we won't find an answer of what is primary FSGS. So during the KBGO guideline meetings, and we had many, uh, we went back and forth a lot. Uh, so I think the unifying theme is that the lower the argument and if people have truly a lot of food process effacement, it's likely going to be permeability factor related. But unfortunately, it's hypothesis because we don't know what this permeability factor is. So one, uh, I'm going to say one bright light on the horizon is that I just accepted a paper in KI reports, which looks at a in vitro system. So you take patients who are getting plasma phoresis and layer their serum onto a plate with, uh, with a primary porocyte culture. You can see, uh, a very sort of dramatic change in the phenotype of the uh, of these porocytes. The actin filaments gets mm -hmm. you know disorganized, and there's a lot of uh, reactive oxygen species uh, species production. So 
this may be one way to know at least that which patient has a permeability factor and which does not. So uh, these patients, as you know, are very difficult to treat at times, and uh, there may be a completely different set of treatments, including this apheresis that we saw, uh, mm -hmm. until we know what this factor is, right? So that's one uh, short answer. But the important thing is that when you look at prognosis, it's really proteinuria. So if you cannot control proteinuria, there is going to be progression. So no matter what the underlying cause of FSGS is. And that's the reason why in most of the clinical trials that we are doing currently, we are focusing on proteinuria and reduction of proteinuria as the primary endpoint because we know that through multiple observational studies that the degree of proteinuria directly correlates with the decline of EGFR. So the optimal duration right now is, 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 is there's good news because we have something called the EGFR slope where even a change of slope of one uh, ml per year is enough to predict a adverse outcome many years downstream. So you don't need the trials that are at five or 10 years in duration where the progression is slow, but we can document just a change of say one ml per year between treatment and placebo. You, you have a study that's powered enough to, to, to sort of give us an idea of how good or bad patients can be doing. So, so that's so that's a very good new development, and this new new uh, definition of uh, of partial remission for FSGS also shortens the duration because in six months you can tell if this FPRE endpoint is achieved, and that's going to uh, uh, translate very well to a longer term uh, ESKD or doubling of creatinine endpoint, which we cannot run trials if we would use those endpoints. Sure, absolutely. To try to get to an endpoint that predicts progression to end stage certainly helpful. You and also you alluded obviously the holy grail of primary FSGS is knowing what is that permeability factor because obviously if you could detect it, you can select patients better. So one of our attendees asked that are there any updates in the realm of permeability factor that uh, uh, could be causing this podocytopathy? So we're hoping with, with these uh, Neptune and other studies that we can get you an answer, but there's nothing yet on the horizon that's, uh, that's promising, unfortunately. Yeah. We have several questions as it pertains to treatment of patients with steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome. So would you use uh, tacrolimus instead of cyclosporine? Do you use them interchangeably? And also, if you did use calcineurin inhibitor and your patients perhaps responded partially or did not respond as well, would you consider adding additional therapies such as um, mycophenolate mofetil or Actar gel? Right, so, so one big problem with FSGS is that if you do not respond to initial treatment, the chance of responding later on is not very high. And that's unfortunately the case, but the way I look at FSGS now is that uh, you do not want to torture your patients with prolonged steroid therapy if they're facing side effects. And, Within a month or two, you'll know if there's at least a, a trend towards improvement with corticosteroids. And if that's not happening and the patient's experiencing side effects, I go straight away to CNIs. Um, there's really no difference, at least in my opinion, between tacrolimus and cyclosporin. One should look at side effects to see which drug you'll choose. So perhaps in, in women, you might choose tacrolimus, but in a patient who has free diabetes, you might choose cyclosporin. So this is some features of each of these side effects that these drugs have that might help you to choose one over the other. But there's really no difference in the MOA and uh, mechanism of action and, uh, and uh, effect on protein between the CNIs. Now, in terms of add-on therapies, generally beyond uh, a CNI, at least at our center, we enroll patients in clinical trials. And I think that mm -hmm. should be the, the focus going forward. And if you do not have access to clinical trials, it's very difficult to say what is the next best therapy? And we've tried this, we've tried that, but even at, at our center, if the patient's not eligible for a clinical trial, I, it, it's very tough to say uh, which is the best drug for this patient. So a lot of times, if the, if, so what I, I look at the serum albumin, if it's not very low and it's above three, for example, I'm not gonna be pushing too hard on immunosuppression because the chance that this is gonna be a, immune mediated or uh, permeability factor mediated FSGS is very, very low. So mm -hmm. I would go more towards protein reduction strategies, including perhaps the use of SGL2 inhibitors, combining an MRA, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist with an ARP, and, and those kind of uh, approaches rather than adding on 
therapies and I would mm -hmm. always, always mm -hmm. make sure that they do not have an underlying pathogenic genetic variant. Absolutely. So genetic testing, obviously, in a patient who's not responding is essential. And also enrolling patients in clinical trial is really the way to go. And I would like to add a shameless plug here that we do have an ongoing trial using obinutuzumab um, as a, a potential drug for these patients who are resistant to treatment that's currently enrolling patients. Along those lines that you mentioned, the calcineurin inhibitor, what if your patient does respond to calcineurin inhibitor? How long, you alluded to that a little bit in your talk, but if you could talk some more, how long would you keep the patient? What would be the next step for a patient who's responding, but now is dependent on the calcineurin inhibitor? So now this has become a, a potentially, you know, a decade or two decade long therapy, because once you document CNI uh, dependence, uh, the way I do this is I use the lowest possible dose of CNI, and I don't care too much about levels in that situation because mm -hmm. once I start lowering the dose of CNI, levels drop to one, two, or three. But whatever it takes to keep them subnephrotic, I don't aim for partial remission in these patients because you're going to need a very high uh, dose of CNI to keep them there. And then on top of that, I use these uh, proteinuria reduction strategies. And I've had patients who've been on this for 20 years and mm -hmm. with the relatively intact you know, GFRs. Uh, but it's the most important, obviously, you know, downside is to make sure that the kidneys are not being damaged with, with this drug. Mm -hmm. And do you ever consider switching these patients to rituximab therapy, the ones that have are calcineurin dependent um, as a way of um, sparing them the CNI? Right, so so that's a very important question. The only people I use rituximab are people who have responded to some therapies in the past, mm -hmm. even with partial remission. So in an effort to get them off CNIs, you have in I, I have also used obinutuzumab with yeah. with pretty good effects. They have a big flare um, while on the CNI, and we use a you know a CD20 blocker, and it brings them down to their previous level of remission, and then you try to keep them on the lowest possible dose of mm -hmm. a CNI in that situation. And sometimes you can get them off the CNI as well with a drug like rituximab or open mm -hmm. Very good. And um, you noted that um, the most common single gene that mutation that accounts for genetic FSGs are these collagenopathies. So do you see changes of basement, basement membrane changes on EM? And uh, one of the attendees specifically wanted to know if that case too that you showed, if there were basement membrane changes that would give you hints that potentially there may be a collagenopathy. Right, so this has been a big point of discussion amongst pathologists. Most, many pathologists say, look, if you go back and look carefully, you'll find the very subtle basal membrane you know, changes that suggest alports in patients with a subsequently diagnosed collagenopathy. In this patient, we did not actually. So, and that's, that's the thing with this group of disorders. You don't always see the classic changes of alports. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the key that um, makes it harder, right? That you don't see those GBM changes always, but you just have to have a high suspicion that still could be a collagenopathy. Yeah, one one more point to note is that many of these patients are middle-aged, so they're not young people. This patient was mm -hmm. young when she was diagnosed, mm -hmm. but in our study that we published in the NEGM, many of these CKD use of unknown etiology were in the 40s or 50s at mm -hmm. the time of being diagnosed with CKD and subsequently with the diagnosis of collagenopathy. So yeah. it is as you get older, that becomes a more prominent cause or association with FSG as compared to young people where you know, uh, other diagnoses like formin or uh, NPHS one and two are more common. Yes, absolutely. Um, and you also showed some data on use of SGLT2 inhibitors in FSGS uh, that it could potentially be beneficial. There is definitely a trend towards significance that there are benefits slowing down the progression, uh, but perhaps numbers were too small. Do you have any experience or thoughts on use of a GLP-1 agonist to treat patients who have FSGS, especially in obese patients that may have obesity-related FSGS? No, it's a great question. So just to come back to the SGL2 sort of so I, I think people who have the so-called non-permeability factor FSGS probably have a better response in terms of proteinuria reduction with SGLT2 inhibitors. And it's worth a try. It's very expensive. It really adds on to the cost. But whatever it takes to lower proteinuria is the theme with FSGS. Mm 
Now, with the other group, which is the GLP-1 agonists, um, the data on proteinuria is not that good, just like with SGLP2s. We don't have any data on FSGAs. But with CKD, non-diabetic CKD, we, you don't know yet. But with diabetic CKD, there is some proteinuria reduction. There's clearly a trend towards maintaining the EGFR uh, compared to placebo and standard of care. But I think the biggest bang for the buck is to reduce weight in, in, in people who have the adaptive form of FSGS. And that'll, that's really been shown that weight reduction clearly has a direct effect on reducing proteinuria as well as slowing the progression of, it, of these lesions. Mm -hmm. And there are a few other questions about other kind of protein reducing um, modalities. So what are your uh, thoughts on use of sparsentan um, for patients? Which population or when would you consider its use? So we, we, we cannot use sparsentan outside of a clinical trial. The clinical trial is closed. And I'm yeah. happy to see that the results are going to be available very, very soon. But mm -hmm. again, it, it comes to the same central point of whatever it takes to reduce proteinuria. So if you have someone on an ARB who's still heavily proteinuric, if the drug gets approved, this might be another way to further lower the proteinuria because you can see the difference in proteinuria reduction uh, over and above a dose of ARB. So that's those are all uh, going to be dependent on the results of the clinical trial that's ongoing right now. Yeah, and another drug that has been asked from our audience is mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. Um, any data on that, or would you? So like I said in my in my previous observation, is that if I see proteinuria in any model, I'm going to do the best I can to reduce proteinuria. And my triple therapy is an ARB, an MRA, and then maybe an SGLT2 inhibitor, especially mm -hmm. in IgA, perhaps in other proteinuric diseases as well. But Costs becomes a huge issue because the pharma two are generic, whereas SGLT2 right. are extremely expensive, and uh, you really need to justify its use in uh, in such patients. Absolutely, and from personal experience, ends up being a lot of battle with insurance company to get it covered with many letters back and forth. So it's uh, quite a battle to take on when you're adding these um, drugs. Um, one of our um, audiences is asking, what's your recommendation for a practicing nephrologist to figure out where, what are the clinical trials that are currently running um, for primary FSGs? There's obviously a lot of different centers, like what's the best way to keep track of what's happening? No, it's a very good question. So my suggestion is to use NephCure as the resource for photocytopathies and what clinical trials are going on. You can just Google NephCure, N-E-P-H-C-U-R-E. Um, obviously, going through the clinicaltrials.gov is another way, but you need to know how to navigate that, that site. But NEFCURE gives you a nice description of each trial and which centers are being are recruiting patients in such trials. Very good. Um, you noted, obviously, again, the importance of doing genetic testing for patients with FSGS. Very important. Avoid unnecessary immunosuppression, all the other benefits for donor evaluation, perinatal. Um, evaluation. Is there any situation that you would consider use of a calcineurin inhibitor in a patient with genetic disease? Yeah, so it, uh, my pediatric colleagues do this all the time, and they say that you know, in young people and, and children, there seems to be a response in terms of reduction of proteinuria, which is ultimately what uh, what is going to translate to outcome. So yeah, there's no certainly no harm in using a CNI, but just be aware that if there may be sort of a nephrotoxicity in certain patients. And one needs to withdraw the drug the moment there's a change in GFR, especially in the, you know, over the first six months or so. But you'll notice this, this is going to happen. Yeah. And do you, what do you see the role of doing genetic testing in terms of when you're trying to match the patient into an, the appropriate trial? Um, so, excellent question. So, it turns out that... Uh, Many of the trials that are now ongoing um, actually do include genetic patients with genetic diseases because it seems that porocyte dysfunction, no matter what the cause, if it's a permeability factor or a pathogenic variant, they all come eventually come through pathways that are common. So, so blocking these pathways might be uh, equally effective in both genetic and non-genetic FSGS, yes, unlike immunosuppression, which will not be effective in a genetic situation. So we are eagerly awaiting the results of these trials, and hopefully we'll have the, enough data on the patients with a genetic diagnosis 
that are enrolled in these trials to see if these drugs are useful in reducing protein. Yeah, very important. And I like that you showed at least, for example, with the coenzyme Q10, that's one that we already have a therapy available that you certainly can slow down the progression. And I think it emphasizes that the importance of the more we learn, the more we hopefully will have therapies available for genetic FSGS. And just finding genetic FSGS doesn't mean not to treat, right? So exactly. hopefully we'll have <laughs> more therapies on the horizon. Um, I think we may have time perhaps for one more question. I'm, I'm looking through here. Um, one of the audience members asked, what's the incidence of primary FSGS in a patient who has hypertension? or a hypertensive patients. Um, I don't know if the question is asking if you can separate that from what you're calling hypertensive nephrosclerosis and how do you differentiate? So, so I'm going to say one more time that, you know, biopsy, looking at the biopsy very carefully with the pathologist is crucial. And so the two points we use to separate the permeability factor versus others is the level of a serum albumin. So if you've got someone with hypertension and they acutely develop nephrotic syndrome, that's the key. You don't get the slow insidious progress of proteinuria with the permeability factor FSGS, unlike in hypertensive nephrosclerosis, where there's slow and insidious progression of proteinuria and maybe over two or three years. Whereas in the real, what we call primary FSGS, it happens over a period of days to weeks. There's sudden onset of nephrotic syndrome, albumin drops, become pleurally damages. So that's one way to separate the two. And on the EM, if you see a lot of food process effacement, 90, 100%, that's more towards the primary photocytopathy versus hypertensive nephrosclerosis. And that's a very important way to do Well, I've seen patients who are treated with precisely that, you know, the former uh, diagnosis of secondary FSGS, where, you know, they don't have hypoalbuminemia, their proteinuria, although nephrotic, has been going on for years. And mm -hmm. the kidney biopsy shows signs of vascular disease and limited food process effacement. These patients should not be treated with corticosteroids or any immunosuppression. Yeah, absolutely. And the final question that we have time for. So obviously know that in order to make the diagnosis that you're resistant to steroid, the standard kind of um, term is that you have to be on 16 weeks of high dose steroids. Um, do you see value in terms of changes in protein year earlier on at eight weeks potentially if you have a drop or like what is there a number you look for percent drop in protein urea that would tell you that this patient is unlikely to respond that maybe you can start on the second therapy before you wait yeah. that whole 16 weeks very good question and i should refer you to a to a ki reports article by the group in netherlands and uh, they said if you see an early response to um, in terms of protein urea about 10 percent to 20 percent you Many of these patients will, over time, uh, see a more profound response. So if you don't see any response or if patients get worse in the first month of corticosteroids, and especially if they're experiencing side effects, it's best not to push the envelope and keep going with a long, you know, a, a full 16 weeks. You can, easy, you can switch to a CNI, you know, very comfortably at that point. Perfect. And that's what I yes. do over time. So we are here at top of the hour. Thank you, Jay, and thank you all the participants for the excellent questions and engagement. We also would like to thank our sponsor, Travir Therapeutics. And with that, we'll end the webinar. Thank you all for joining. Thank you very much. Have a great day.